Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I would love to welcome you. Today is Monday, July 13th. I feel energized. And I just want to let you know we are back in our office, uh, phasing us in at Mass Bio. Behind me is our part of our new COVID compliant conference center. And I look forward to seeing some of you here soon. And today we have an a program that has been the top of mind of a lot of people. Here, I will also like to go over the ground rules, but first I'd like to thank our sponsor. July's Make Shift Happen is being powered by Alnylum. Yes, this the very Alnylum that you're familiar with, with all their breakthroughs, and they will tell you, each and every person at Alnylum will tell you that they are responsible for that because of their intentionality regarding and around diversity and inclusion. I would like to thank Al Nyla for everything that you do and for part and also for being a part of this program. With that being said, the ground rules. For the first 20 minutes or so, we're going to mute your audio and your video. And Please feel free to join us at any given time. Jump in, wave so that we can see you. We have a fabulous presentation by our featured guest. And after that presentation, we're gonna open up the mics and video, and please feel free to ask questions at any time. That takes us into our program today on healthcare disparities. Massachusetts is the life science epicenter of the world. Within a 90 minute drive, you have everything from research, manufacturing, investment, government, academics, all types of institutions. I'm very proud of being part of the, M the Massachusetts ecosystem, but also we have to accept and reckon with the fact that great disparities in healthcare access exist in our own backyard. Many healthcare disparities stem from both the disproportionate effects of the social judgments of health as well as an equitable patient access to care. Today, we're gonna to talk about community health partnerships, improving the medical workforce, especially around medical students and also collaboration. We're gonna talk about leveraging biotech's influence. And we're also gonna get a brief update from Zach Stanley, Mass Bio Vice President of Public Affairs about what's happening at the legislative level to adjust some of these concerns so we don't have the same outcome from the early months of COVID-19. That brings me to our special guest, who's gonna walk us through some of these concerns with her presentation, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Margarita Algrea. She's the Chief of Disparities Healthcare Research Unit at the Department of Medicine, Massachusetts General Hospital. She's also a professor in the Department of Medicine and Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Algria, please, thank you for joining us and welcome. Super excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Eddie, and thank people to, for being here. I really, really uh, look forward to exchanging ideas here and starting the possibility of our collaboration. So I want to start with some slides and then um, hopefully Zach has the slides. I'm going to walk you through the topics that I had discussed with Eddie. Um, and uh, I hope that you don't get into Zoom fog because we're all so uh, burnt out by, by Zooms. But I wanna walk you very quickly into how do I think we could reduce mental health inequities? What is the opportunity that I see in biotechnology and community collaboration? Next, let me start by saying in the next slide that I have no conflicts to disclose. Next. And this is uh, pretty much what I'm hoping to cover in the 20 minutes that I have. I'm gonna cover disparities in COVID just very, very briefly, but then I'm gonna jump into COVID-19 and mental health. And then I'm gonna talk about why mental health costs are higher for people of color. What is the impact that they're having? And then very quickly, I'm gonna go into how biotech can intervene. I'm gonna talk first about how to help uh, cities invest in public health, but showing you some, some data, and then the importance of community-based organizations as the grassroots movements that can make a difference. 
And then finally, I want to end with the importance of expanding technology as a way to decrease these disparities. Next. I think people have seen this data, but I think it, it, it really matters to, to see it up close and personally. Uh, the huge disparities in terms of the percent of cases by race and ethnicity of COVID. Uh, as you can see here, uh, COVID is the canary in the mine that showed us the exponential rate of disparities and how it's dramatically impacting uh, the populations of Black or African American non-Hispanic and the same for Hispanic non-whites. You can see here uh, the percent of the population compared to the percent of the cases in this first graphic, and it's pretty alarming. Similarly, in rate per 100,000, you can see here how Black and Hispanics again have exponential rates compared to whites and Asians. Next. I also want to tell you about why I think uh, COVID-19 moved mental health to center stage. And really, uh, this is no, not surprising at all. In fact, there's been a lot of data from when uh, H1N1, uh, the flu epidemic, and also the SARS epidemic uh, has shown, and even the, the bubonic plague, uh, that you know, when you have infectious diseases uh, are very likely to appear when you link poverty, inequality, and uh, lack of determinants of health that can help people cope. There's evidence that particularly one of the things that has been alarming is how fast this has triggered mental health problems. Uh, in, in surveys that were done by the Kaiser, we saw that 45% of adults are already uh, reporting that mental health uh, was impacted negatively as a result of COVID. 54% of people that lost their jobs are talking about mental health uh, impacts. And even close to 30% of people that have been quarantined in a very early uh, report that was done by Brooks uh, showed that around a third of people that are quarantined start getting very depressed and that if they are uh, quarantined for a longer time period, it's even worse. There's also great, great work that has been done on economic recessions and how these economic recessions uh, are likely to increase almost three times the rates of depression and anxiety uh, substance abuse, and even suicidal behaviors. Just to give you an example, in March, uh, SAMHSA, the, the agency that deals with mental health and substance abuse, got a 300 increase in calls of people asking for help. Uh, we've seen something very similar at the hospital where people are really calling because of their mental health. Next. I also wanted to emphasize something that I don't think is very well known, and that has to do with the cost of mental health problems for communities of colors. The, the cost is so much higher, and people wonder why is the cost so much hard, higher for communities of color. But if you think about it, it has to do much more by structural inequities that have to do with policy, with law, governance, culture, and actually with individuals. First of all, these are the communities that are exposed more to poverty. They have less options to work remotely, dramatically less options compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, they tend to have unstable scheduling of jobs, so they really cannot plan uh, and work at a distance. And finally, they're the group that has the lowest wages and benefits. So as, as a result, we're really steering people of color to mostly unfair experiences, differences in opportunity, and we're limiting the uh, access to social determinants that can not only affect how you cope with stress, but it can also affect how you recover from mental health problems. Uh, it's not only the adults that suffer, but it's also their children who are more likely to experience these negative uh, shifts. 
we know for a fact that you know family relationships under the stressful circumstances and we've heard it in the press we've heard it in you know several re uh, radio shows that have come out that there's increases in domestic violence increases in childhood maltreatment uh, people start withdrawing from close personal relationships if they think they're uh, uh, doing badly and family conflict. Next. I also want to show you that this is not something new. In fact, this is just because we are able to see it now very close and personal. But if you think about it, many of the things are very linked to race, ethnicity, as in this graphic being linked to socioeconomic status but also to the social, political, and economic conditions, and including in the policy. And all of these things in themselves are linked to the explanatory variables that show us differential health outcomes that have to do with mortality, morbidity, self-rated poor health, cognitive uh, function, and depression. And this is for diabetes and uh, coronary heart disease and well-being, but it actually ties to much, much of what I'm going to be saying. Next. I think it's here that I want to spend most of my talk talking about the role of biotechnology, how given the, your 2025 vision statement representing the premier global life sciences and healthcare hub, with members dedicated to preventing, treating, and curing diseases through transformative science and technology that brings value and hope to patients. This is where you really can do a transformative change in this disparities. Next. I wanna to talk today, and Eddie had asked me, well, what do you think we could do? What are the areas where we could be investing if we wanted to change these disparities? I told her I would think about three areas that are really, really able to be transformative. The first is helping counties or cities invest in public health, and I'm going to be very uh, broad in sort of explaining why. The second one I will explain is strengthening community-based organizations. And lastly, it's expanding tech access for low-income neighborhoods so that we can improve the efficiency of telemedicine and all other uh, information resources. Next. Let me start with the first one, which is helping counties, cities invest in public health. Next. If you look here, you know, public health agencies, which by the way, have been gutted in the last uh, decade, and, and there's a lot of evidence of this cutting in the uh, public health agencies in our nation. Uh, you can see they provide critical assistance and support. They're really the heartbeat of preventive and crisis uh, when pandemics hit. And they also, because they are really the heartbeat of uh, preventive medicine, uh, help us lead healthier and more productive lives. The unfortunate fact is that in the US, we invest very, very low money in public health. For every 97 cents that we use of health dollars go, goes to medical care. And it's only between 2.5 and 3 cents that really goes to public health. Over the last decade, as I see, CDC has been losing a lot of staff and being cut it down dramatically suggesting that if we really want to change what we're seeing right now, we need to reinvigorate these structures at the county and city level. Next. There's, you know, the, the amazing thing in all of this is that if you look at voters, voters really believe in public health. They really think it makes a difference in their health of their communities. However, although voters agree, there seems to be a disconnect between the priorities of the voters and how monies get allocated to healthcare spending. So as you can see here, uh, even 57% of voters say they would be willing to pay higher taxes if we were able to ensure good health, public health protections. Next. 
Why should we consider investing in public health? Well, I think, first of all, it, there's uh, lots of data, scientific evidence of uh, the high yield of return in prevention. However, the, the high yield is long-term. This is really a long-term proposition. You don't see the effects very uh, rapidly. So part of the problem we have had is that many don't want to invest in uh, public health because, uh, for example, insurance companies are not necessarily going to see the effects of preventive health immediately in their populations, but maybe decades later. It also has uh, a really important impact in social determinants of health because public health can identify where we need to invest in low-income communities, where are the problems coming from, and then we can also invest in infrastructure for prevention and evidence allocation of resources. We can do decision making a lot better if we know what in public health is needed and where it's needed and for whom. This early identification of pandemics, and especially I wanna emphasize the importance of uh, interagency coordination that can happen when you have a public health sector that is strong and that can tell you what's happening at the community level. And finally, public health has the opportunity of monitoring, monitoring whether the outcomes that you're seeking by uh, your uh, strategies are working or not. So it's, it's really a, a super important area. Next. The other thing is that, you know, public health can be the site where you actually decide what are the social determinants of health that are needed. We know social determinants account for a lot of the health outcomes. But, you know, the funding to uh, give this uh, social determinants and access them is still very fragmented. Uh, we know that community prevention, and especially with uh, the combination of social determinants, can have a uh, presence for improving health outcomes. But you need to really be on the ground with a, a trusting uh, community organizations that can help you advocate, for example, the reduction of tobacco or improving school environments or lifetime choices. And also, this can be the site in Massachusetts. The public health does a great job at the level of the state of monitoring epidemics and then trying to identify scientific evidence of how best to address them. We're very lucky in Massachusetts that we have a great state agency that has taken the, uh, the move to actually collect platforms of information around, but that needs to strengthen the public health at the community and county level. Next. I wanna go into why I think the second strategy is strengthening community-based organizations. Next. If you think about community-based organizations, uh, they're really the agencies that try to fill the needed gaps when public health and human service agency, uh, their funding is just insufficient. Community-based organizations, and here I also include uh, fairly qualified community health clinics that are really there at the front in trying to address issues of housing, employment, food insecurity, uh, anything that impacts health, and not just medical services. They do a great job of really trying to seek resources that can be funeral to low-income communities, especially low-income communities of color. They really, really make uh, a, an incredible job by addressing these issues but they confront challenges both in they have operational shortcomings because these organizations are incredibly frail. They are under terrible financial stress and they have uh, several capacity limitations. For example, we actually were doing uh, some work. We actually do a lot of work through our community-based organizations. Uh, and we were doing um, a trial on a disability prevention. And they didn't even have enough chairs to do the exercises. And the exercises required chairs for people to sit down and get up 
and uh, they require some very basic uh, equipment. And even that was not available. We had to buy, for example, certain basic components to be able to do uh, the actual trial in the community-based organizations. Next. But there's, uh, there's actually a framework that I love to use because this framework really tells you about if you wanna do big systemic change, big transformations at the level of systems, there are three things that are needed to be done. One is increasing the pathway capacity, meaning how do you connect organizations with each other? And this is where connecting community-based organizations as centers of outreach and treatment sites could be a win-win for everyone. These community-based organizations are groups that people trust, where people are willing to come. Uh, These community organizations already have a network of outreach, and they serve in many, many ways as treatment sites for different um, issues. The second thing you need to do is increase program comprehensiveness. And this means that community health organizations uh, with community health workers, which is something that our a center is doing, but many others have done that, can provide the wraparound services to coordinate treatments and support consistent uh, goals. So for example, there's been great work of uh, community health workers helping in uh, screening for uh, lung cancer or uh, screening for breast cancer. There's community uh, health workers that actually do a lot of work, for example, with homeless populations, bringing them in and offering services of food and trying to connect them to housing. The third thing is increasing pathway connections. And that means that you need to not only connect the agencies, but actually connect this community-based programming so that when you find needs in one, you can connect them to who has the available resources to respond to those needs. And that could be faith organizations, it could be government organizations, or it could be advocacy or legal uh, groups. Next. We also think CDOs uh, are really uh, doing an incredible work of trying to address uh, what some agencies uh, confront because they have shortcomings in terms of their cultural responsiveness to ethnic and racial minority groups. For example, we know many of this organization don't necessarily have linguistic capacity uh, to serve. So CBOs, uh, in, especially in the medical arena or in the mental health arena where we work, we find very, very few non-English uh, resources for providing uh, care or even for providing information and resources. So community-based organizations have people that look like them, that talk like them, and that are culturally uh, responsive to their needs. And that's something that really makes a huge difference in people being willing to invest in time and resources and a bridge with them. They also facilitate a lot of community involvement and empowerment. So it's not only uh, looking at them from a deficit, perspective, but also an asset perspective. And then they can address the gaps and needs if they are bridging with these other resources. So for example, we know that a lot of uh, communities at risk and people, for example, are undocumented immigrants are willing to seek aid from CBOs rather than other channels, even the medical care or, or pro, uh, primary care providers due to mistrust. So CBOs are really in a great position for preventing negative health outcomes. Next. I wanna show you, you know, what we think is the human service ecosystem that can be built by joining public health and human service agencies with community-based organizations 
philanthropic organizations, the private sector and academic institutions to really, really try to improve the lives of people of color. Uh, we have around in this, in the United States, around 218,000 community-based organizations all over the United States. They tend to serve one in every five uh, people in terms of human services. They uh, cover around 3.2 million employees and they actually, uh, with their economic activity uh, generated through wages and services, it's around 200 billion. Next. So in, in Massachusetts, uh, we actually identify around 78 community-based organizations. We wanted to look at our uh, CBOs that actually have financial integrity, that had trust from the community, uh, and that had good use of resources. 52 of them are in Boston, and 24 are located statewide, meaning they cover more than one site. Uh, and this uh, organizations really offer anything from immigrant services like MIRA or affordable housing assistance or youth and family services, neighborhood advocacy, and many more. Next. However, these CBOs have barriers. Uh, first of all, I think there's the perception that uh, they are ineffective, sometimes that they're very disorganized because they're frail, and uh, that they are really not sustainable. Many of these uh, things are not sustainable. But part of that public perception is really because they lack the resources to establish consistent programming and have people that stay there so that there's not staff turnover and over. They also have operational inadequacies that have to do with they, they don't have the time to establish good collaborations, sometimes difficult for them to measure their return on investment or the outcomes. And many times they lack data sharing capabilities to show what was the actual uh, benefit of the resources that they provided. They also have uh, deficits in capital, uh, tech, and personnel, and many times they really cannot spend time in innovation of services. And the government funding and fundraising usually is very, very minimal for this uh, community services. So at times they really are very limited in their cash liquidity, and they also sometimes have to go into litigation because of how they are really offering services. Next. And last, I want to cover technology, expanding technology, because these three areas, public health, community-based uh, collaborations, and expanding technology access in low-income neighborhoods uh, so that we can improve efficiency of telemedicine, but also of other information sectors is, is so critical. Next. There is a still a technology access deficit, even with everything we've heard about COVID, we've seen even in Massachusetts, one state that is so uh, wealthy, the uh, technology divide that exists. And yet the lack of teleservices for education, for uh, healthcare, for remote work, really exacerbates these disparities uh, in these areas. Uh, in my own office at MGH, we've had to buy to three of our um, staff uh, out of 23. We've had to buy computers because their computers didn't really have, uh, were coming in and out and were not reliable to really do their work. There's also big issues when we try to do uh, telemedicine with, uh, in some of our trials that we're seeing that many people don't have broadband uh, and lack notebook computers uh, to actually do very basic uh, telehealth uh, in, in information gathering or even some basic, uh, you know, information for resources for COVID. So this is one of the areas that could diminish this deficit uh, divide. Next. 
So we're seeing more and more uh, that people do have phones and they use uh, some phones that they have uh, to try to get as much information as possible. But many of them are on limited data plans. Many of them don't have reliable uh, internet and therefore they have inequities in resources and opportunities. This digital divide, uh, it's a, a, a division that really goes for income groups, but it also goes in terms of uh, coaching people on how to use information and communication tools so that they can benefit from social and economic development. So if you don't have today a good computer that, you know, and access to broadband, it's really hard to get in into so many of the opportunities that people have. This also has uh, issues for people of academic achievement and employment opportunities. And there's uh, data that shows that internet capable technologies really correlate highly with academic achievement and employment opportunities. Next. Uh, I want to show you to the left, the digital divide. And although this information is uh, 2015, uh, there seems to be, and there's more now, but still there are differences if you see here in people not having, which is the, uh, the gray bar, no broadband or no computer. You can see it's 21.2 for white uh, non-Hispanic. It's uh, for blacks, it's 36.4. Uh, while for Asians, it's only 11.9 that don't have broadband or no computer. And for Hispanics, it's 30.3. So a lot of, uh, of a, a big digital divide by race and Hispanic origin. And this uh, technology, technological uh, division to access uh, communication and informational technologies uh, can contribute to a cycle of social and economic inequity. So this is where we want to put our money in trying to really get people to have broadband and being able to connect uh, in, in technologically uh, to be able to, to really participate fully in school or remote work or making out virtual connections. Next. I want to also show the importance of health information. This uh, digital divide uh, also has tremendous impact for health information. And I want to cover how it does it and, and open then the floor uh, to how, what people think about it. But what we're finding is that this uh, makes a difference in people being able to hack access, for example, interventions that are available through apps or information regarding medical conditions, or even uh, filling in information to get, you know, uh, either apply for a job or even uh, get your disability uh, employment insurance compensations. So they function as barriers, this inequities in health information to health uh, and contribute to health outcomes in people in, in poor communities. I want to show you the example next. I'm going to finalize with the example that we have. For example, we're now doing a component of mental health treatment that includes all of these components where people talk about their thermometer and how their mental health is doing. We talked about psychoeducation, how to, under, how to identify trauma symptoms, how to identify anxiety, depression, if you're having problems with gambling, if you're ha having problems with elder abuse, uh, issues with sleep deprivation. Uh, we're helping them also do motivational interviewing so people can uh, really look forward to having mental health services and seeing with them the importance of paying attention to their mental health as something that benefits the whole family. We do breathing retraining, we do mindfulness practice, cognitive therapy uh, skills and recovery skills, all the way from HIV testing, counseling and prevention. But we're finding that many of the people that are 
uh, part of our trial can only do the phone. They're not able to even do Zoom or able to spend a lot of time on the phone. Uh, to some of them, we have to buy phones and send them in because it, there is a huge technological divide in our poor communities of color. So with that, I'm gonna let it go. And uh, I wanna next show you the team, which I'm so honored to represent. It's uh, our Disparities Research Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. We are, our mission is to generate innovative health and health services research that helps shape policy, practice and service delivery to reduce disparities and improve the well-being of diverse populations. Thank you so much and I'm ready for your questions. Hi, is somebody moderating or can somebody, can we just jump in? Yeah, oh, no, sure. please jump in. Just Very jump active. in. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Sarah Nocher. I'm in head of regulatory at Al Nilam, and uh, thank you for your talk. I'm afraid I had some trouble coming in, and I don't know whether you covered this, but one aspect that is close, um, you know, to what we want to do is, it's it's sort of not quite linked to what you're talking about with regard to COVID, but it's sort of tied in also to aspects of studies that are done. Uh, and clinical trials, given the business that we are in, and how do we, you know, get minorities and increase the number of minorities in our clinical trials? And is that, I mean, without having to derail the conversation, is this something that, you know, there's a group that I know there, I think ED may be working on this, um, but I just wanted to see if there's anything further uh, in recent um, developments uh, with regard to that. Um, both for COVID as well as non-COVID, uh, you know, clinical trials. Right. So we we do work with our, our communities. I would have to say in our trials, for example, uh, to give you an idea, 70% of our trials are with uh, communities of color. I think the, the basic um, tenant that we have uh, in all of everything we do First of all, we offer our trials in, in right now in four languages. So there's one of the biggest things that we do in, in being able to uh, engage people and being willing to be part of a trial and being interested in um, interacting with us is that we cover things in their language. So we are actually doing Spanish, English, Mandarin, and Cantonese right now. And we're actually moving to additional languages to offer whatever we have in a trial. I think the second thing is we do a lot of engagement uh, and training. We invest so much in training so that uh, people feel that we are servicing them. They're not servicing us. And that is how we approach them, how we really care for them, how we follow up on them, uh, how we link them to resources. So everyone knows that it's a long-term proposition. And lastly, because the experience has been a good experience, we get them to come back. So I think that, you know, in terms of including more minorities, I think the, the important things is the trust that you're building in those communities and also the relationship that they, you have with them so that they feel that you are servicing them and it's not the other way around. I don't know, Sarah, if I answer your question. Yes, no, it's a long process, I think. And, um, you know, it would be good for, for um, those of us that are in the industry to also know how to tap into that uh, sense of trust, because I completely understand that, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of reason for distrust or mistrust. And so uh, we have to build that relationship, but it would be good to figure out how we can sort of um, leverage some of the trust that you're building in to ensure um, throughout the country uh, to encourage more uh, yeah. people of minorities. And, and I think, Sarah, the other thing we're doing is that, you know, I think you have to, when you're doing these trials, you have to think who's the messenger, who's the person that's connecting to these communities, that's someone that they trust and also uh, that has credibility. So those things are very important. And lastly, I would say we spend an enormous amount of time in the people that we that are our ambassadors 
to really have very respect, dignity, and, and really uh, treat people nicely. Go for it. I don't know if there's other questions. I'm happy Thank to Thank you answer. for that response. It seems like we may be having some technical difficulty on uh, Dr. Allegrea's side. We're going to Can you work hear me? with those and, and the interim. We're going to. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Dr. Yes. Can you hear me? Let me call you. Can you hear me? It's going in and out. Okay. Let it's me. going in and out. So while we work on yeah, that, that may be on your Zach end. Is I, going I, to I go over a. Hey, Edie, it's Zach. It's I think that may end. be on your okay. end. Okay. 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 So you can hear me, Zach. Okay. Is that correct? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions people have? I would love to hear uh, people from the group. Hi, this is Susan from Ellen Nylum. Thank you so much for everything you shared. It was really interesting. And I just wanted to ask about, um, when you were talking about community-based organizations and how there were some issues in terms of them being able to uh, showcase the positive results they had done and just having uh, metrics to give back to investors or the community. What kind of work is being done or anything that you know of that CBOs have leverage to kind of show the positive results and where we could potentially grow in that area? Uh, that's a great question, Susan. I think there are several things. Uh, people want to look a lot to uh, metrics such as quality of life. Uh, and there are short versions of quality of life that could be done. We're also using a lot of testimonials. It's actually been quite useful to show testimonials of people that have had um, experiences, but also to show one of the things we're doing more and more is uh, collecting data of, you know, like for example, one of the trials that we were doing on disability prevention, we showed them the results and actually made the results very, uh, I would say consumer friendly so that people could understand, you know, what does the meaning of this change in either symptoms or functioning uh, really prove. And then we also were able to walk them through uh, explaining, you know, how the clinical trial uh, was very clear in where were the benefits of the intervention. And that was extremely useful because right now we're in the second round. We got funding from the National Institute of Aging uh, or in the National Institute of Mental Health in another trial. And then people are willing to come to us again because they, they trust us. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, it's Praveen Tipranami from Morphic Therapeutic. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, two questions. One is, um, you know, what have been the reasons for the public health infrastructure being uh, I think you underinvested it. And, and now that we know from, uh, you know, from the last few months about the unpreparedness, you know, in lots of different areas, you think that investment will change? That, that, that's the first question. The second one is, you know, a lot of folks on the call here are, are, are biotech companies. Um, and is there any specific recommendations that you think would have impact? Well, I, I think the reason that there was very little investment, I mean, I've talked to insurance companies and part of the reason is the investment in, in uh, preventive and public health uh, is really very long term, as I said. And it's, it's hard for an insurance company that doesn't know if they'll have the same clientele to really invest in someone that they don't know if they're going to be their end release, you know, three years from now and where they're gonna see the impact is five or 10 years from that. Second, I think the um, medical community has become so uh, basically sophisticated uh, with precision medicine, you know, biogenetics, all of it, that it's hard to invest in something that doesn't, uh, doesn't look very sexy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result, you know, people have to choose where they cut and since prevention is very hard uh, and public health, sometimes it's very hard to see the impact until you don't have it like now. Uh, I think in terms of your second question, I think the, the importance of investing in uh, public health platforms is gonna be huge because we already know that things happen very quickly 
And if you are not ahead of the curve, there's very, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to anticipate and put things into perspective. And this is where, uh, for example, and also see what works and doesn't. I think one of the good investments that Massachusetts has done is their uh, public health data information uh, that researchers like us can access and then test things to see the way they work and see the, at the population health impact. So I think that that's, that's a win-win for everyone. And that's why the legislature went ahead and reinvested in the public health data set. Okay, thank you. Edie, um, this is probably a good opportunity to talk a little bit about what's going on at the, at the State House and at the Baker administration as it relates to these topics. I can just give a high level overview there. There are a number of proposals and initiatives around health disparities, um, specifically around COVID, um, and a number of them are actually moving forward. Um, the Baker administration last week just announced that they're implementing free testing programs in eight of the hardest hit um, communities in Massachusetts where COVID hotspots still really are prevalent despite our general um, positive trend lines. Um, so communities like Chelsea, Everett, New Bedford, Lawrence, and others um, are now going to be having free testing programs for any resident there, which uh, the Baker administration is hoping will help with their test trace um, uh, regime. Uh, at the legislative level, um, there's a Senate bill that's been proposed um, around telehealth um, implementation, making sure there's parity there in terms of insurance coverage, which really is the last step for allowing wide-scale use of telehealth in Massachusetts. It's previously not really been something that's been used at scale prior to COVID. Um, so that's very positive news, I think. And the, health, the House has indicated they're very much on board in passing some sort of legislation around telehealth as well. So it does seem like something that will happen in the next few weeks, although the details um, are much up in the air about how that's going to play out in terms of parity for video calls versus audio calls and things like that. Um, but there definitely is a lot of attention right now um, around things like that and data collection to um, health, health disparities around COVID uh, care and treatment. And with that, I think um, Edie may be having a few technical difficulties on her computer. So if there's any other questions, I think we have time for one more question. Well, we did have one more question, Zach, if you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. uh, someone would like to ask, what conversations should they be having with their company and with whom? Like people in biotech want to talk to the appropriate leaders, let them know about these concerns and it's important to them, but who do they go to? What department do they go to? Uh, what department where? Do you mean in public health or in community-based organizations or in... in uh when you're talking no within biotech like if you were to oh. if we were to ask you who do the individuals speak with in biotech i think i mean i it would be ideal to have a community liaison that really is the person that can connect you know with depending because i i think a lot of people don't know depending on different things if it was resources or if it was technological help, if it was development of assistance, uh, assisted uh, tools, um, I think at least the way I'm understanding the question is people would need someone that can tell you with whom do you connect. Uh, like we have for case management, so we have a person that connects to everyone else in that system, but it's just one person that they have to make the linkage to. So who would it be in biotech? Uh, who would you recommend, Eddie? Well, actually, that's a good question. I would say um, our connection would be towards the Governor Affairs Office, the Public Policy Office, and also the Patient Advocacy Offices. Mm -hmm. And the person also had a follow-up question, what can they do as an individual? Well, I think as an individual uh, pushing for uh, community resources, uh, it's especially, you know, I think we are, we're all paying a lot of taxes, but I think probably not enough to make this disparities disappear. So as an individual, I think this difference of being able to put your grain of salt or grain of sand, I'm sorry, 
to be able to either provide uh, resources to community. There's a lot of volunteer work that's going on that has been instrumental in the COVID epidemic. People volunteering to see uh, people, for example, elders that are isolated and reading them through Zoom. There's been people doing help, uh, uh, actually uh, helping in education with uh, children that don't have parents that can spend the time in uh, homeschooling. There's been, so volunteers are really a heartbeat for this communities of color. So offering yourself as a volunteer, especially in youth organizations, uh, helping people uh, in terms of, you know, filling in paperwork is, would be instrumental. Well, I'm checking to see if anyone else, I'm looking through to see if we answered all of the questions. We have one more question uh, from Crystal. Crystal, if you want to jump in and go ahead and ask your question, that'd be great. Thank you, Edie. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I just want to be sure. Okay. Hi, how are you? Hi. So, yes. so my question was just surrounding um, health coaches, you know, and I'm not sure if that's something that you're familiar with, but, yes. you know, I'm hearing, you know, just as far as the lack of trust, um, you know, with, you know, certain communities, whether it be the black community or um, just, you know, minorities in general, um, has there been any, you know, conversations about um, hiring health coaches, um, you know, and is that, you know, something that, can be done like as far as insurance is concerned, things like that? So the only area where I know, uh, there are several areas where health coaches has be, have been used and have been uh, used quite effectively. Uh, for example, the area of health coaches for uh, people that have chronic disease and mental health has been used, those health coaches. And uh, there's evidence that uh, they do make a big, they make an impact. Uh, health coaches have also been used for addiction services. There's less evidence about that, but there's uh, oncoming evidence coming out for people with addiction uh, problems. And so there are, um, there are some uh, ongoing uh, studies uh, showing the benefit of health coaches, but they're all not uh, positive. I think partly because health coaches can mean many things to many people. I think some of it, it does get uh, paid. For example, uh, Medicaid might pay for a health coach if it is something very related to uh, like chronic diseases, this was able, they were able to pay for it. But not, not many of the insurance companies pay for health coaches. I hope I answer you. You did, thank you so much, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time with this program. I would like to thank Dr. Alegria for joining us and shedding light on the topic matter and bringing us more so into the conversation, especially from this side of biotech. We look forward to partnering with you more as well as the community-based organizations, as well as pulling together as an industry to see what we can do to help you as well. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Quick shout out in regards to our upcoming August 18th. Uh, EDNI conference. It's our third annual and it's going to be jam packed. We also have our State of Possible conference and that's August 26th. And I welcome anyone to send any program ideas as well as guest ideas for Makeshift Happen. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again on July 27 with Pratt Wiley, who is president and CEO of the partnership. And we're going to have a biodiversity program update. We're going to talk about Black America Me Too movement, as well as advancing people of color post-pandemic through sponsorship, professional development, and succession planning. We'll also like to thank our sponsors. Al Nylum, thank you for everything that you do. Al Nylum will tell you themselves that they are powered by inclusion. And I look forward to seeing you on the 27th. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much.